Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to take a dip back into the well of Blom and Voss and all of their strange aircraft designs. The one I want to look at today is definitely one of the stranger ones in that it looks like it could be from Star Wars, perhaps being driven by a young future Jedi slash future Sith and future guy that breathes really loud. This is the Blom and Voss P-170 Bomber. Now, in the realm of military bombers, generally the ones that are the more iconic ones are the big lumbering behemoths, slow, armed with a plethora of turrets, and heavily armored as far as aircraft are concerned, and often accompanied by fighter escorts. While more vulnerable on their own, their much higher payloads and greater operational range offer significantly increased destructive potential that make them ideal for things like strategic bombing, potentially wiping out entire cities in a single run. While these kind of bombers were more sought after by the likes of the U.S. Air Force and the British Royal Air Force, the German Luftwaffe tended to stick closer to a different bomber concept called the Schnell Bomber. Schnell Bombers, which translates to Fast Bomber, were just that bombers that prioritize speed over payload and defense. The idea behind these bombers was that they would have significantly smaller payloads and little to no defensive armaments or armor in exchange for high speed. Defensive turrets would add extra sources of drag by virtue of the gun barrels sticking out of the body, and armor increased the weight and thus lowered performance. Instead, they would be equipped with high-power engines that would give them very high speeds for military aircraft, let alone bombers. Because of their high speed, they would simply be able to outrun any attacking enemy aircraft. So, while they wouldn't have nearly the same destructive potential as more conventional bombers, they would ideally be able to survive on their own without escorts meaning that the German Luftwaffe wouldn't have to spend additional time and resources for escort planes, and instead could use those planes for other roles or missions. However, the main problem with a good deal of Schnell bomber projects was that the advancement of aircraft technology would mean that a high-speed bomber that was just even a few years old would quickly become an average-speed bomber. A good example of this is something like the Junkers Ju-88. When it was first flown in late 1936, it could hit speeds upwards of 360 miles an hour. This was very fast for a bomber, especially for 1936. However, as an operational warplane, it was a good bit slower at around 300 miles an hour. Still, for 1936, that was great. The problem lies in that fighters would rather quickly be able to outclass that top speed in just a few years, if that. This made true blue Schnell bombers with no defense much more volatile, in a sense, constantly needing to be on the cutting edge of technology in order to survive. It's probably because of this inherent volatility that a lot of so-called Schnell bombers, like the Ju-88, do end up having defensive weaponry. Not as much as the larger, slower bombers, mind you, but defensive weaponry nonetheless. Regardless, though, Nazi Germany had a bit of a fascination with the Schnell bomber concept and would look for new Schnell bombers for a great deal of the war. So, in 1942, Blom and Voss, and more specifically, a man named Richard Vogt of Blom and Voss, would throw their hat into the ring with the P-170. Measuring in at 13 meters long and 16 meters wide, the P-170 had a very unique looking three-engine layout, one in the center and one in each wingtip. Each propeller would be powered by a BMW 801 engine with around 1,860 horsepower apiece, bringing the projected top speed up to around 510 miles an hour. The two wingtip mounted propellers would rotate in opposite directions in an effort to increase performance. This would have two effects, one intended and one potential effect if they took it. The first effect is a reduction of the negative effects of an engine's torque. As the engine causes the propeller to rotate in a given direction, an opposite rotational force is generated. 
having the wingtip propellers rotate in opposite directions would thus create opposing rotational forces that would ideally negate each other. The second potential effect would be a reduction in drag. A problem with wingtips is that they naturally create a vortex of air behind them, and this vortex causes drag, which can reduce speed and overall performance. Each wingtip propeller could be made to rotate in the opposite direction of this natural vortex, thus canceling it out, significantly reducing the plane's drag and improving its overall performance. However, there are significant reasons as to why these wingtip propellers aren't very common. Such a layout means that the wings would have to be heavily reinforced to accommodate the weight of the engines, and if one of the outer engines were to fail, it would cause significant asymmetric thrust, more significant than your standard multi-engine aircraft. It's likely these factors that make designers shy away from this kind of engine layout. It has popped up from time to time, to be sure, but it is very, very uncommon. Now, in the P-170's case, with it having three engines placed as they were, the asymmetric thrust issue wouldn't be as bad. If one of the wingtip engines were to fail, it still had that central engine to help balance out the thrust of the other engine. Instead, the P-170 had more of an issue with weight distribution. Because of the wing and engine placement, a great deal of the plane's weight was located at the very front of the fuselage and ahead of the wing itself. This would end up making the P-170 horribly unbalanced and front-heavy if it had a more standard-looking cockpit layout, so, to help balance the weight, the cockpit had to be placed at the very back of the fuselage, far behind the wing. It's this cockpit placement that really adds to the whole Star Wars pod racer vibe. The pilot would be sat in the main cockpit, it's the one that's furthest back. The co-pilot slash observer slash bombardier would be sat further up the fuselage in that more cylindrical looking glass there. While I can't find a specific reason as to why they decided to design it this way, I would have to assume it was to give the bombardier better visibility than he would have otherwise. Regardless, the second mini-cockpit wasn't viewed as being all that useful because an updated design from later in 1942 removed that separate bombardier placement and instead just extended the main cockpit. Continuing with the strange design choices, we have the plane's tail. Viewed from the top, nothing appears to be out of the ordinary, but when viewed from the side, the oddity becomes more apparent. At the tail, which is also where the cockpit is, there is no vertical fin or rudder. Instead of having a normal vertical fin or rudder, the P-170 has two, one on each wingtip at the tail of the engine nacelles. Why this was done, again, I'm not entirely sure. Perhaps the rudders being around where the midpoint of the plane was would have some kind of ideal benefit they wanted on stability and control. However, I only know of one other plane with this kind of wingtip midpoint rudder design, and that plane had pretty severe stability issues. So the evidence that I'm aware of of such a rudder design isn't all that great. If you do know of any other planes with such a vertical fin and rudder design, do let me know. The last thing to mention about the design was something that makes sense given the rest of its design, but it is still a bit different. Because of the three separate engine nacelles that were spread so far apart, it had to properly support the weight of them while on the ground, so each nacelle had a wheel under it to support it. The tail also had a wheel, just a small one that kept the tail and cockpit very low to the ground. This isn't an overly strange aspect of the design, but I did feel it was worth mentioning anyway. For the P-170's weapons, as it was to be a pure Schnell bomber, it had no guns to speak of, and instead would be outfitted with either 1,000 kilos of bombs in a standard load, up to 2,000 kilos in an overloaded state, or 12 rockets in two bunches of six. These would all be located under the wings on either side of the fuselage. Because of the projected speed of the P-170, it is likely that it would have functioned closer to a dive bomber than your standard bomber. But I say that it likely would have functioned that way because the P-170 would never be made in any capacity. 
The reason for this, apart from the inherent weirdness of the design, was likely the increasing prevalence and testing of jet engines. While jet aircraft hadn't been introduced in 1942 when the P-170 was designed, testing on them had become increasingly more prevalent. Flight testing on the jet version of the ME-262, which would be adopted later in the war, started in mid-1942. While the 262 was a fighter, it could certainly be equipped with bombs, rockets, and or guns, while also being faster with the jet engines, and it used a more conventional design that likely wouldn't require so much trial and error. If the German government were to make something so unconventional like the P-170, then it would have to blow its potential competition out of the water for it to even be considered, let alone made. And because even in the most optimistic predictions, it likely wouldn't outperform jet aircraft, then really what would be the point of making it? But still, let's assume for a minute that they did decide to make it. How would the P-170 have performed? For one, I do think the top speed would likely not have been 510 miles an hour. If we use the testing of the Ju-88 as an example, I think it's likely that the true operational top speed would likely have been in the lower 400s at best. Still a great top speed, but a good bit slower than projected. I also struggle to imagine that the wingtip rudders would control all that well, and them being positioned where they were just adds potential mechanical issues that were unnecessary. I think that just for simplicity's sake, the rudder would be moved to the tail like normal, and perhaps the vertical fins would remain on the wingtips for an attempt at better stability. Regardless, taking in the entire design of the P-170, if it had a prototype made, I still think it would have been a one-off project. Its design was overly quirky and likely would have taken so much time to properly test and iron out any kinks that its development would likely have taken until the war ended, and by then, better planes were here. Inevitably, the P-170 would likely only be what it really is today, another weird design from Blom and Voss. And on that note, we're going to go ahead and stop for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. While I reference Star Wars at the beginning and towards the middle, I've never actually watched any of the Star Wars movies. I've never had any urge to. I get all of my Star Wars knowledge through the video games, like the LEGO Star Wars and the old Battlefront games. Not the new Battlefront games, I've never actually played those. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!